If you weren't a dancer, what would you have been? An astronaut, okay. Traveler. She did not like dancing when she was growing up. You know, she had this dream of being a doctor, but she got married off at 15 and ended up being a dancer. So I will started choreographing my own dances and nobody dared to correct me or ask me why you did that. And then, so that, that, that freedom was there for me. When you look at the history of the community, just like many other ethnic communities out there, in the early days, you mainly learn about men. Mrs. Sanda Basker is one of the rare female names that stood out to me. As a curator, I don't think we could have done an exhibition on the Malayali community without including their stories inside. She was born in 1939 in Kerala, South India, to a Malayali family. Everybody in the family learned dance and music. She did not like dancing when she was growing up and she would. She told me so many times that she would fake a tummy ache to get out of dance. She really liked science and she really liked math. She told me, you know, if I could go to the university, I would be so happy. My mother ended up in Singapore by accident through marriage. Interestingly, a lot of people thought that Mrs. Sandra Basker who founded the Basker's Arts Academy, but it was actually her husband, Mr. K.B. Basker. His mission in life was to spread his love for the Indian arts around the world. He called his brother back in India to help him look for a bride, and they found my grandmother. So February got married in the beginning of February. So February, March, April. By May, first week, we already came to Singapore. My grandfather definitely I brought my grandmother on an adventure. This marked the start of a 16-year-old girl's adventure to grow a dance academy from the ground up with her new husband in their new home. When she first landed in Singapore, she used to say that I was just amazed by the multiculturalism living amongst all these other ethnicities. She only ever read about in her history books. Her first reaction was that she needed to be able to communicate because she only knew how to speak in Malayalam. She joined the British Council for classes in English and then just language. She learned some Mandarin, she learned some Malay, just enough to survive. And she very quickly wanted to learn Chinese dance. She actually learned the ribbon dance, the sleeve dance, the sword dance. Butterfly Lovers was my mother's first cross-cultural collaboration. She saw the movie, the 1950s movie, in the movie theaters and she came back and she was just talking about what a lovely story it was for dramatizing in dance. The story is about an ancient China where a woman was not allowed to study, but this uh, girl, Zhu Yingtai, she, she really wanted to study, so she dressed up as a man to attend school and that's where she met Liang Shanfu. Um, and then they fell in love. I could see how my mom was so inspired by the story. A lot of themes that are very similar to Indian culture too. The whole idea of women not learning, not being able to go to school. I think this was back in 1958. It was classical Indian dance, but they wore Chinese opera costumes for the performance. Bharatanatyam is an ancient classical Indian form. That is the original dance form that my grandmother was trained in. I think it would have been really different for the people of the time to see Butterfly Lovers, a well-loved Chinese story performed in Bharatanatyam. She liked choreography more than I think anything else. I feel like she had so many ideas and they're just waiting to be explored. But over the next 10 years, it wasn't easy to keep the Boskers Arts Academy going. My parents were very trusting. People cheated them a lot. People would hire them for productions. After the performance, they would turn around and say, I'm really sorry, we didn't have any money. The second biggest challenge was finding the number of students. There weren't very many Indians who could afford to dance in those days. So they had to travel to Johor, Penang, Pahang, Ipoh, Malacca, just to survive. When Singapore became independent, uh, she had lots of students actually in Malaysia, but because of the separation, it made the travel there a bit more difficult. You have to make a living. 
So I had to be more aggressive than the local people trying to support us in all of that was really a difficult time. How do you give your children the best education and the best opportunities when your income is already so small? They just needed to get the work out there. My mother wanted to change how she did Bharatanatyam only because they needed to survive in Singapore. Visually, how do you make it appealing to someone who didn't know anything about Bharatanatyam? Make it palatable for someone who's um, not Indian. I think any art form tends to morph and evolve in the diaspora, but how it grew in Singapore is totally unique because of what a melting pot Singapore is. You have Chinese, Malay, and Singaporeans, and Eurasians, and so at the time, the British living in Singapore. So, so many things I learned by watching people. So we, we, we used to perform together, like, all ethnic groups performed together as in, in one stage, shared same stage, and then at times we used to like collaborate together. When I started choreography classes, that's when I clicked, oh my god, my mom is a genius. Because <laughs> she had never had any choreography classes. And she was using all of the choreography techniques already when in the 70s. I was like, this is my mother, you know? Totally new level of respect for her. She changed Bharatanatyam into what it is in Singapore with her ideas. She started doing group choreography, which was unheard of in the 50s because Bharatanatyam was a solo dance. She incorporated all of the spacing elements that you use in folk dance and Chinese dance and ballet into her dance. When I was younger, she was criticized for her work. People who came from India and started teaching in Singapore would say, that's not really Bharatanatyam. She always rose up and said, you know, I am not doing anything bad. I'm not being disrespectful to the art form. I'm just modifying it to survive. And for the art form to survive, she definitely inspired everybody else to take the form and do something new with it. As her choreography and teaching career took off, Santa's past made a reappearance in her life when she was 77 years old. Getting even a very basic understanding of the complex quantum world and a physicist research program took much effort. I decided that this was an idea I wanted to choreograph a dance with. When she got the opportunity at NUS to work with the Department of uh, Quantum Physics, I think she was the first one to raise up her hand and say, yep, I'll, I'll do it. If I travel around the world, I don't know whether I can come across any other Indian artist who has done such a collaboration before. I'm thinking about it, I got goosebumps. I do believe that she enjoyed bringing the science into her practice because that was a part of her that she had to put aside. I remember coming home and they were on the sofa and my father was talking about the black hole, or explaining it to my grandmother, and she was like writing notes down. She went to the university to, to attend those lectures. She was in her 70s, yeah. I was actually in the, in the piece. One of it was about like particles. There was like one that was like intertwining. Well, even the music at some points were a bit like unusual. You know, it was like electronic music. Everything was like, it didn't look right, but it like made sense. I think to a certain extent, you have to be childlike to be creative. And that was my mother. In the 1950s, the Boskers Arts Academy started with just a handful of students, but it grew to more than 2,000 strong over the years. Everywhere I went, Boskers Arts Academy would always stand out. It's always the name that we hear. Mid-80s, I think, is when it started to get better. They found a space at Sanford Art Centre, and that's when things started to really, really boom for us, I think. I think we were there for 29 years, and at that point of time, it was our biggest space that we've had. We had so many students. It was always busy. It was always noisy. Feet stamping on the ground, or like drums play. The scale of the productions uh, really upped at that time because we grew, we had more students, we had more money. 
often saw her appearing in the news and I noticed that Vasquez Arts Academy had actually done a few performances during the National Day celebrations. She was actually the longest serving tutor of Indian classical dance in NUS. A lot of her students would either call her auntie or they would call her like grandmother. The National Heritage Board in 2021 presented her with the Stewards of Intangible Cultural Heritage Award. In 1990, I believe she was also awarded the Cultural Medallion Award for Dance, the highest accolade that's presented by the Singapore government. And as a young Indian girl in the society, I always felt like one day I want to become as well known as her. She never sought out any accolade. Whatever happened to them came because they were on that river. Uh, we didn't see it coming at all. We all thought that she had a good 10, 15 more years to live. I remember that morning she woke up, she drove herself to NUS to teach, and then after that she headed to the performing space where we were having the opening ceremony of our 70th year festival. She said that she wasn't feeling so well, so she sat down and she asked for a drink. My auntie went to get her a drink, but when she got back to my grandmother, she was already slumped over the table. It happened at the place that she loved. You know, she brought all of us up in that studio, and to her, that was what fed her kids and, and nurtured you know, the next generation of dancers. Favorite gifts Uncle Basker has ever given you? Do you believe? Yes, do you believe? Cake or ice cream? Ice cream. Favorite flavor of ice cream? Strawberry. Do you believe in ghosts? I don't think so. I miss her voice. I miss her wisdom and I miss her. And she was just an incredible person. I would not be who I am today and be in the arts, I don't think, if it weren't for the experience I had through them. When I was really young, I would sneak into her class and she would see me, so I would lie down on her lap and watch her teach her classes. My teaching style, even my dancing style, I think they all kind of like go back to her. I mean, for me, she has always been my biggest inspiration. People ask me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I say, I want to be just like Amuma. She told me that if it ever gets in the way of your dreams and your happiness, close it down. But it's 70 years of legacy, nothing like it anywhere in the world. They were very one of the first artists in Singapore to stand up and say, proud to be Singaporean, this is our Singaporean art form. I'm not going to apologize for what we are. Carrying on that legacy for them is important to me. I am who I am because of that. No matter what, she made sure that 70 years later, there is still a school standing. Basque's Arts is still standing and it is now expanding. <laughs>